Yeah, thanks a lot, Johannes, for the for the introduction. It's great to be here and presenting uh, to this audience in this very nice seminar series that you are uh, organizing. Um, yeah, I'm Bernardo, PG student in Alex Stark Lab, uh, and today I want to show you our work on using deep learning and the massively parallel report assays, enhanced assays, uh, to study the the sequence code of uh, enhanced elements in particular. So our genome contains all the information to generate all our different cell types with different morphologies and functions. Um, and perturbations in the sequence is also uh, the cause of many diseases. So understanding all the information encoding the genome can really drive this diversity of cell types uh, is very important to understand both development and disease. And that's kind of my, my main exciting aspect is to understand uh, the, the, the code of the genome and in particular the, the regulatory code. And why is that? Uh, the reason is that um, genes are actually a very small portion, portion of, the, of our genome, and most of the genome contains the, the non-coding cis-regulatory elements that regulate when and where each gene should be, should be expressed. So this regulatory code is the, is the most part, actually, of, of the genome and the most uh, difficult to study and, and poorly understood yet. Uh, but still the, the most relevant for diseases uh, to some extent, because mo the majority of disease-associated variants mostly for polygenic diseases, for example, uh, are fall, the variants fall into these uh, regions and these regulatory elements. And in particular, uh, enhancers are the most uh, abundant regulatory elements, and they, and they uh, enhance the transcription of the target genes in specific cell types and conditions to, to regulate when and where each gene uh, should be expressed. And these are, are a typical a few hundred bases of, of, uh, of DNA. Um, but to really understand how the enhancer activity of each sequence is encoded uh, in the sequence is still a big challenge and the main uh, interest of, uh, for my PhD studies. Uh, an important characteristic of enhancers is their ability to activate transcription outside the endogenous genomic context. For example, the limb enhancer of the Sony Ketchup gene is composed by this exact DNA sequence, and when isolated uh, in, into a, a reporter uh, assay, it can drive transcription of the reporter specifically in the limbs. So this shows that all the necessary information is encoded or contained into this in, in the DNA sequence, and that we can use also simplified reporter systems to study some of the properties of, of these enhancers. And if you look back to what were the approaches that people used to characterize enhancer sequences, uh, so, so the first main uh, uh, type of analysis were based on individual characterization and very systematically of individual enhancers. For example, the EVE uh, two stripe uh, enhancer or the sparkling enhancer, interferon bet enhancers. And this uh, systematic dissection of enhancers really showed that the main building blocks of enhancers are binding sites for, for transcription factors. So this was the, the, first, uh, the first days, but with the development of reported assays and in particular, uh, high throughput reported assays and sequencing technologies, we're able to, to assess the activity of many different enhancers, uh, in, in this case, in Drosophila embryos, for example, and start uh, having large sets of enhancers active in different cell types. Uh, this combined with high throughput chromatin and transcription factor binding data allowed now to have large sets of enhancers to study their sequence properties more systematically. And, and with this came, for example, transcription factor motif analysis, uh, which com combined with previously comparative genomics allowed to identify a set of transcription factor motifs that are characteristic of enhancer classes with specific properties. So for example, here again, for Zophila, enhancers of a particular tissue are enriched for particular transcription factor motifs. Uh, and this is kind of the common way of understanding enhancer sequences is by this dissection uh, of the motif composition. So that's what we, we know about enhancers. The, the information is encoded in the sequence and con they contain motifs, these short uh, DNA binding sites that are recognized and bound by, by sequence specific proteins called transcription factors. And is a combination of these proteins and the machinery, the transcription machinery that is recruited that drives the activity of the target gene. Uh, and so enhancers contain combinations of motifs and these motifs are usually characterized or defined based on uh, this type of position weight matrices which should uh, kind of characterize the binding affinity of a given protein to the DNA. For example, for the ADS protein, this will be a, a typical motif. And then using this motif, one can go back to the sequence and identify instances of a particular motif in an enhancer. And you start seeing that enhancers contain combinations of motifs. 
However, this, was, this information of the presence of motifs has been uh, insufficient to explain the different types of enhancers and their regulatory activities. Um, and several groups have proposed uh, different uh, features, more complex features um, related to the arrangements of these motifs in the sequence or the, the motif syntax, for example, that can relate to the cooperativity of the different transcription factors that they interact together. Uh, and so these type of features, the number, spacing, orientation, order, and so forth, have been important um, to enhance activity in certain enhancers, but has been very difficult to characterize uh, the exact uh, requirements for, for, for a given enhancer. Um, and, and that's where, where we wanted to understand what we wanted to understand better. Uh, and for these, we, we thought that we needed a kind of more complex approach that could learn these, these more complex features uh, to be able, in the end, we have this ideal scenario where for a given sequence, one will be able to predict its activity, identify the critical basis, identify these transcription factor motif syntax rules for different types of enhancers, and ultimately uh, the, the de novo design of synthetic enhancer that could open some, some interesting uh, possibilities. Um, and so to address this question, we wanted to kind of take a step back and go away from just identifying motifs uh, and, and find a way of predicting this enhanced activity directly from the sequence and use that information or that modeling to, to address the, the next questions. And here, that's where the, the deep learning part ca came in, and, and that's why we are here in this series also. Uh, so together with other people, um, it has been now shown that deep learning approaches, in particular convolutional networks, are very powerful to model uh, DNA sequences and the re regulatory aspects of DNA sequences. So we wanted to, to build a model now for enhanced activity kind of a ultimate ultimate step of the re of like regulatory activity of, of an enhancer sequence. Um, and after building a model for predicting enhanced activity, try to use it to understand better these properties of the regulatory code uh, and, and ultimately even design synthetic enhancers to test uh, the sufficiency of these of these rules. And just a, a brief recap of why convolutional networks are suitable for this type of, of tasks. Uh, so if we consider DNA sequence uh, here uh, on the left has a one hot encoded matrix, we, we can imagine that it's kind of a, an image um, and that we can scan filters to find, uh, to identify the presence of different patterns. Uh, and you can imagine that filters can be actually these position weight matrices that I mentioned before. Uh, and in a convolutional layer, you can scan a given position weight matrix through the sequence to identify patterns. Um, and then by stacking convolutional layers on top of each other, uh, you can actually find then combinations of, of patterns or combinations of motifs, for example, uh, using these higher order filters. Um, uh, but the cool thing is that all these filters or P P PWMs are learned during training. Uh, so you don't need to, to use an initial set um, of, of motifs. Um, and you can then use, yeah, learn these higher order features and later have a model that combines these detected features to, to predict a given outcome. So, so they are very flexible for, for different molecular profiles. In this case, uh, an example with the binding of two different transcription factors. So this is the, the approach and the, the idea. Um, and, and so what we did now back to, to our work was to build a deep learning model to predict from the DNA sequence and enhance the enhanced activity in a given cell type. And in this, case, in this case, it was in Drosophila S2 cells, or so fly S2 cells, which was the model system that we have in the lab. And as training data set for enhanced activity readout, we used the, the reporter S is StarSeq, developed in our lab as well. So the idea of StarSeq is that the reported assay in plasmids outside of the, the genome, but tests every DNA sequence of the genome in fragments uh, in a kind of clever way because it places the candidate sequence downstream of the promoter. So if you have a minimal promoter, you have the candidate sequence downstream. And if the candidate sequence drives transcription very strongly, or meaning it acts as an enhancer, it will activate the transcription of itself. So it will be present in the RNA in large abundance. And by measuring just the RNA, you can compare to the input DNA library and by the enrichment, see which sequences are overrepresented. And then look, for example, in a specific locus, plot uh, using this uh, by stacking all the reads and find regions that are very active, uh, that produce a lot of RNA in a given uh, star six screen. And um, in Drosophila, we, we know that there are two main transcriptional programs, enhancers that activate uh, developmental genes or tissue specific genes or housekeeping genes. And so Francisca in the lab, with whom I collaborated in this project, did the experiments, did the star seek either with a developmental core promoter or a housekeeping core promoter to identify enhancers specific to each program. 
And uh, here you have an example of, of the data. Uh, in a specific locus, you have the enhancer sequences for the developmental genes and the same for the housekeeping genes. So you can imagine that you have now these data genome-wide uh, and it was a very clean data set. And the fragments are around 250 base pair. Uh, so then the idea was to build a deep learning model that will map these 250 base pair fragments that were tested to the enhanced activity in a multitask way uh, to, to predict the activity of a given sequence in the developmental and in the housekeeping screen. So here is a convolutional neural network that we designed for this approach. It's quite a simple convolutional neural network with four convolutional layers and two fully connected layers. Again, a multitask, so predicting for the same sequence, both developmental and housekeeping. And again, the, the concept or the intuition is that in the first layers, you will learn local sequence features, like detecting the different types of motifs. And then later, you, you might detect some of the syntax that I mentioned in the beginning. And later, you will decide how to use these features to predict uh, an enhanced activity. So it's a single model, one sequence, two outputs. And we can evaluate the performance in, in these held out test sets uh, part of the chromosome. Uh, as you can see, the, the predicted profiles in these locals look very similar to the observed ones, predicting well both the developmental and also the housekeeping um, enhancers. Uh, and if we look at all the test set chromosome bins, genomic windows that we, we use in this case, this is how it looks for the developmental screen and for the housekeeping, a Pearson correlation of around 0.7. Um, as you can see, it predicts very well the negative ones, and then for the positive ones, it predicts well the dynamic range, but with some over and under predictions uh, still, uh, but it performed uh, good enough to at least explore more complex syntax rules that I will demonstrate later. So these are the, the first part, uh, building the model. The second part was to, to interpret the model, and I told you again before that uh, the, the way people have were used to look at enhancer sequences using these PWMs to identify instances of different motifs. But we now, we now with these models, we can change the way of looking at DNA sequences and use interpretation tools to actually score the contribution of every nucleotide uh, to the enhancer activity, kind of recovering those motifs, but finding their importance or and even other types of features. So this is based on, on methods developed by Anshul Kundaj and others. Uh, and in this case, you kind of back propagate the gradients uh, for a given sequence, and you back propagate the predicted value through the gradients to identify which input features are important for the prediction. And here, the input features are the actual DNA sequences, so you can have this score, scoring of, of every nucleotide and, and biasly recover the important features. And this was very cool because it recovered the motifs, although the model didn't know anything about these motifs, it could learn them through, during training. Uh, and these are typical motifs that we knew were important uh, in this cell type, or at least the transcription factors themselves. We did this for all enhanced. Uh, and one way of validating these nucleotide scores uh, was by uh, doing a scanning mutagenesis experiment. Now this is experimental data where we took an enhancer, this, this particular enhancer, and did a scanning mutagenesis by scrambling 10 base pair windows with five base pair steps of perturbing the sequence, measuring the enhanced activity using the star seek with these oligos, and then compare how the star seek observed data compares with the deep star predicted ones. So these are the, the observed data. So every bean uh, has this bar plot showing the fold change. So these regions in particular were very important for enhanced activity. You scramble that, that region, the activity drops a lot, and it overlaps with these uh, important motifs predicted by uh, the deep star contribution scores. And you can also, score the actual scrambled sequences uh, to make it more comparable and see how well deep start predicts these perturbations in the sequence and observe that it correlates very well uh, the, the position of the motifs and the positions important for these enhancers. But of course, we couldn't do this for, for all enhancers, so, so we focused later on, on motifs, um, and that's what I'm showing here. We did these contribution scores for all important, for all enhancers for the developmental uh, part of the model, for the housekeeping part of the model. And we used TF Modisco again from Anshul Kondaja to recover the main uh, motifs predictive of both enhancer types, uh, as I'm showing here for developmental, AP1, gacha motifs, uh, and others. But for the housekeeping, we found different set of motifs, which should be expected because the two programs are kind of uh, not overlapping in terms of which enhancers uh, are active in each program. Um, and after having this set of motifs, we wanted to validate their importance and compare what Deep Star predicted uh, to their experimental um, importance uh, in the respective enhancers. 
So what we did was to, we tried to select a set of uh, transcription factor motifs, a set of enhancers, and mutate uh, in every enhancer all the AP1 motifs, GAT, Tetris motifs, and so forth. And that's what is the impact in enhancer activity. Here measured heads of twofold change. Uh, we did the same for some control motifs that should not be important. And the same for some housekeeping motifs, but in developmental enhancers where they should also not be important. And here's the experimental data showing that the AP1, GAT, Tetris, and TRL motif are, are important for enhanced activity overall. Uh, in the developmental enhancers with their different strengths uh, correlated also with the uh, AP1 being the strongest uh, TF modisco motif followed by GAT uh, and then TWIST uh, and TRL as well. And the same in housekeeping enhancers we mutated developmental and housekeeping motifs and again only the housekeeping motifs are important for the housekeeping enhancers while the developmental were not. So this was kind of a large scale, scale experiment that we used to validate uh, the predicted motifs but also the predicted motif instances uh, in every enhancer. Um, and this, so these validated the motif types, but regarding the motif instances, more specifically, we found some interesting uh, observations. Um, so this is a, an enhancer, and I told you before that motifs have multiple number or multiple instances of the same motif type uh, of them. This is, for example, an enhancer that based on deep star would be predicted to have three Gato motifs. Uh, so this is just a reverse orientation, uh, but deep star predicts them to have different importance. Uh, although they are kind of the same GATAA uh, forward or reverse. Uh, so we wanted to test uh, if, this, if this is too experimental, if they have different importances. So we mutated each one individually or the three at the same time. And compared with the wild type activity, so this experimental data now, compared with the wild type activity, when we mutate the three motifs instances, uh, so the activity is gone, it's at zero. But when we, when we mutate each one at a time with the same exact mutation, uh, you see that the third instance is at the least importance, uh, followed by the first and the second or the, the most important, uh, kind of correlated with the with the active, with the importance predicted by by Deep Star, and this was uh, the same not only for these enhancers but across 1,000 GATAA instances. When we mutated them, we saw this large uh, large dispersion of the importances experimentally. And when compared with the predictions by DeepStar, we saw that it predicts uh, to a good extent which GATA instances are important and which ones uh, are not or less important. And we did this not only for GATA, but for other motifs in developmental and housekeeping enhancers and compared the performance of, of the DeepStar with the, if you would score the motifs by a PWM approach uh, using the best PWM performing for the, 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 the respective transcription factor, and you see here that it uh, usually outperforms uh, the PWM. Uh, and, and so it, this suggests that the PWM being local is not sufficient to capture the importance of the motif. And we'll consider that the GATA is very similar, independent of where it sits. Um, but it might not be the case and the deep learning model by taking into the, the whole enhancer into, into account can capture better why in some positions the GATA is good uh, or not uh, for the enhancer. Uh, and why is that? Uh, so by doing different analysis, we kind of found that this is due to, the, or at least there are two main features that explain why uh, some motif instances are more important than others. One is the flanking nucleotides of the motif. Uh, and the second is the spacing to other motifs and likely interactions at level of the, at the level of the transcription factor. And I want to show you briefly how, how, we, how we did this. So for the flanking and nucleotides, uh, one approach was to take all the GAT instances in the different enhancers and rank them by the predicted importance by DIVSTAR and then just call or, or just kind of find what are the nucleotides around in the very high scoring uh, GATAs and the low scoring GATAs. And if I, and you can start seeing some patterns, for example, at the plus one nucleotide that there is a lot of yellow, a lot of Gs at the top GATAs, while at the minus one, for example, uh, a G at the minus one is enriched in the negative or in the low important gutters. Um, and if you summarize, if we summarize here, you see that for each position, you have kind of the importance of uh, the respective nucleotide. And for example, for the plus one and plus two, you have specific preferences uh, for, for the gutter motifs and the same for the minus one and the minus two. Um, but if you go for a different transcription factor motif like the TRL, which is a kind of a GA repeat motif, you, we did the same and saw that the top TRL motifs uh, are enriched for GA-rich uh, flanking sequences. 
um, again, showing that these flankings will be uh, important. And this is uh, all predicted by DIVSTAR, but we did the same based on the mutagenesis data. So ranking the motifs by their importance by mutagenesis and recovering the logo similar to, to this uh, logo here. Uh, and again, the G at the plus one position, for example, uh, but not a G at the minus one position uh, was uh, important for the, for the ones validated. Uh, by the metagenesis and the same for the TRL, that the, the best version of, of this TRL motif would have GA-rich uh, flanking nucleotides that could go over uh, to four repeats, three, four repeats in each side. Um, so this is a way of characterizing why uh, the model is giving more importance to some instances of the same motif and not to others, uh, so the flanking nucleotides. And then we, we looked at the, the distances between motifs. And here we use the, an in silico analysis first to try to find what are pairs of motifs that might interact and at which distances. And the idea is that you, you can design sequences in the computer with two motifs at different distances, for example, further away or close to each other, and ask what is the predicted cooperativity kind of uh, over the expected uh, additive um, behavior. And for example, for the ads strabi p uh, pair of motifs, we saw a synergy exclusively at short distances. So it's kind of close to additive, but if they are closer than 25 base pairs, you see this positive synergy uh, driving strong and enhanced activity. Uh, so it is very interesting that the model can capture this. And by doing this for all pairs of important motifs, we found three main modes of uh, cooperativity. So two motifs uh, um, cooperating exclusively at short distances, like this 25 base pair uh, distance, two motifs that cooperate most of the time, but not when they are close to each other. They seem to inhibit each other when they are closer. Um, and the most common case was kind of a global cooperativity that decays with distance. Uh, but overall, it's still, they still cooperate to drive the enhanced activity. Um, and this was also interesting that it depends really on the transcription factor motifs. So if you, for example, anchor on, on one and you say, okay, GATA against different types of motifs, you can find that together GATA, different motifs will have different behaviors. So a negative sequence will have no, no, beha no cooperative behavior, but then uh, the gata with an X will have this mode one, the gata with the second gata will have this mode two uh, with the decay at short distances, uh, and the gata with an AP1, for example, will have this global cooperative uh, scenario. So although the gata is the same, the partner really dictates what type of interaction um, we have. And uh, for example, for X, which was a, one of the main mode one factors, it's kind of known to be important uh, to have to be close to other transcription factors for protein protein interactions, which might explain why uh, these short distance uh, interactions. And again, we wanted to validate these predictions. Um, so the way we did was to go to enhancer that have motifs, specific pair of motifs at close or distal uh, positions and mutate to one of the two and then ask if, that, if it's more important when they are close or when they, it's distal uh, to the other motif. For example, for gata gata, we would predict that when they are close to each other, they are less important than when they are further away. Um, and that's what we see when we mutate. Uh, so the ones that are further away have a stronger impact in enhanced activity here in log two full change compared with the ones that are closer to each other. Uh, for AP1 gata is uh, the opposite. They should be more important when they are close to each other uh, and we see um, consistently, that's kind of uh, what happens. So the close to each other, they are more important, although they are still important when they are further away. Uh, but this we also expect uh, here. Uh, so overall, we kind of can validate at least the, the direction of these effects, uh, but still with a wide distribution showing that there are other features playing a role uh, on the importance of a, a given motif uh, still. So I think we can imagine that all these features are interacting together at the same time, and we can test one uh, at a time, but um, but not all at the same time at this point. Um, so this was in, in drosophila enhancers. In, in fly enhancers, we wanted to then just validate some of these rules in human enhancers using these reporter uh, assays. So what we did was to focus on, in this case, human HCT116 colon cancer cell line uh, enhancers. And just to give you an example, uh, again, we, we looked at an enhancer uh, with the particular enhancer chromatin marks. Um, and mapped the positions of the AP1 motif, which is important in this cell type, uh, and again mutated each instance individually. And for example, this enhancer contains four AP1 instances, but based on the mutation fold change, only three are important, while this one is not important. 
And this is consistent with transcription factor footprinting data from the, the ENCODE, showing that there is footprint only in these three motif instances, and this one is not bound. So again, in, in human enhancers, this, there is this non-equivalence of similar transcription factor motif instances. Um, and we saw this for different transcription factor motifs. So for the, again, for the AP1, we have, when you mutate 1600 AP1 instances, we have this diversity of effects. And we wanted to explain this importance of AP1 motifs according to the rules that we found in Drosophila. In this case, using a simple linear model just to combine these rules and see how, how much predictive power one has. Um, and this is the, the predicted uh, mutation impact by the model. Uh, and you see that it predicts around 0 0.5 um which with pcc of around 0 0.5 which ones are more important and which ones are less again this is better than just taking into account the sequence and the pwm because it's taking into account the flanks the, inter the number and the interactions with other uh, motifs uh, and because it's a linear model it's very easy to interpret so we could actually go to this model of the ap1 that has around 0 0.5 Pearson correlation and score the contribution of these features and and see that the number of instances, the flanking sequence, and then the distance to specific motifs uh, was important uh, for, this, uh, for this model. Uh, so for example, here again, the AP1 with the ETS motif, uh, this, this particular distance was important. If you look at what helps predicting the ETS motif, you see also the opposite that the, the AP1 itself uh, helps to predict uh, if the ETS is important or not. So this is similar to the Drosophila where you have the AP1 ETS uh, interaction as well. So again, in, in human enhancers, you have this non-equivalency of motif instances um, that can be explained to some extent based on the syntax rules, number flanking sequences, and distance to other motifs. And, and then last, we wanted to, to test this uh, kind of uh, synthetic and design approach to see if the model could actually have some generative potential. And the way we, we did this uh, was to uh, kind of a more a brute force approach, just design random sequences, score them with deep star, uh, and then select some that are predicted to be weak, medium, or strong that don't exist um, in, in the genome, uh, and then experimentally test uh, if, if they worked as expected. Um, so this is the, the experimental activity by StarSeq of a set of these synthetic sequences and compared with, nat nat with the native enhancers that have this activity. Um, here, grouped by different beans according to the deep star predictions we saw that it, it correlates to to a good level so the the weak ones are indeed very weak or inactive and then the strong ones are as strong or, or, or stronger than the the native ones although they are completely uh, synthetic and then we looked at some of those and just to show an example of our strongest synthetic enhancer it was interesting to see that the, the models still capture kind of the complexity of motifs and their arrangements and not just uh, pasted like arrays of motifs. Uh, and so they actually looked pretty similar to, to native enhancers in their complexity of motifs and the arrangements of, uh, of motifs. Um, so to conclude this, uh, this main part, uh, so what we did to dissect uh, the enhancer sequences was to build a deep learning model convolutional neural network called DeepStar to predict from the DNA sequence its enhanced activity and used it to, to understand uh, the enhancer sequence rules, finding this uh, non-equivalency of motifs and that um, motifs need to be analyzed within the series regulatory context and the context of the other motifs. And that these models are very powerful because they can capture this type of complexity um, and they even allow us to design uh, synthetic enhancers. Uh, and now in the last two or three minutes, just wanted to, to briefly mention our recent work that tries to kind of go further on these syntax rules, just to show you how complex they are. Um, so to try to understand better this flexibility of enhancer sequence and the motif syntax rules, uh, we tried to kind of test what constraints exist at, at different positions in a given enhancer, and did an experiment where we tested in a given position that we know is very important for a given enhancer. Uh, for example, in this position, you had an AP1 motif, we replace this AP1 motif by all possible eight nucleotide variants, created the library, and screen the library in StarSeq and see to test which variants drive activity or not. Because we knew that if you mutate the motif, uh, the enhancer is dead. And so if we look at the actual enhanced activity that we observe for the around 65,000 variants, we see that most of the variants here are inactive. And then there are a few hundred sequences that can actually recover enhanced activity. 
Um, and this was interesting first because there are only a few hundred, so it's not very easy uh, in, in this type of sequence space to recover the activity of this enhancer in this particular uh, context. Then there were specific motif types that were created by these active sequences, but not all motif types. So not all motifs that are important in this cell type would, were able to recover the activity at this position. And by testing different positions, we actually saw that depending on, on the position, different motifs can actually work uh, at each position. Uh, so suggesting that it's constrained by the, the motif syntax. Um, and we, we again try to find the, the rules that uh, explain why some motifs work at some positions, but not others, and cross compare with Deep Star. Um, and, and the second approach that we took was kind of the other, the other way take a motif that is very important, like an AP1 motif, place the motif in hundreds of positions, and see if in every position it will increase enhanced activity. Uh, and for example, for a Gata motif, this is the distribution that we get. So in, in some cases, it has a zero impact in activity, so it doesn't increase the activity, while in other cases, this is a log to scale. It has many folds of increase in activity, the same sequence in hundreds of contexts. Um, and, and if you do the same for the ETS motif, you see again, again these widespread uh, of effects. Um, but if you look at specific positions, like in orange, this is the same position, both motifs can activate this position. While a given position like this purple one, only the gata can and not the ETS, uh, and in the green is the opposite. So, so it's not that the ETS and the gata motif will work always in the same position. In some positions, both will work. In other positions, only one would work and not the other. And the same for the other motifs. And in the paper, you'll see that we characterize why the gata works in some cases and the ETS uh, in other cases. And we can explain some of that based on these uh, motif syntax features. Um, and just to, to leave a not look for what, what we are, what are kind of the next steps for us and for the lab. Uh, so it, we are really trying to ex extend also similar to other groups to, to different cell types to now start understanding the enhancer code in different cell types and how they differ. Uh, what are the to kind of get to a more general regulatory code of, of the genome um, and then move these synthetic enhancers also in vivo to different uh, drosophila and mouse embryos. Uh, after you, you can get these models for the different cell types, you can now also design synthetic enhancer that will activate the expression specific cell types. Um, and then in human cell lines, use uh, these models to predict the impact uh, of diseases. So I think this is kind of exciting questions for the, where the field is going on uh, at the moment. Um, and finally, just to thank uh, Francisca with, uh, that's worked with me and did the experiments for, for the deep star part, uh, Michaela, Alex, which is my supervisor, the whole group in the beautiful Christmas in Vienna. Uh, yeah, all the funding and you for your time. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.